title of the talk is Molten Salt Reactors, How Might Safeguards Be Designed In? I am very interested in finding out what questions you have because I am actually trying to design around safeguards issues, proliferation issues, and political issues in the nuclear industry and trying to solve those. So the more feedback that I get, whether it's positive or negative, doesn't matter to me, the better. So please don't hesitate. I have done every type of reactor that you can imagine. All right, so I've done all the water reactors. I've, op I've operated several. I've uh, done maintenance work on, on them and I've started up 15 different reactors. I was starting up uh, two brand new reactors a year when I left Capital and one refueling a year. As you might know, the US Navy has gone away from re needing to refuel and stuff, but some of the older ones and stuff still need refueling, but that will be the last refuelings that they ever do for that. Um, uh, but one of the big things that Capital always did was basically um, look at every type of reactor out there for alternatives that would improve, import, uh, improve performance. Uh, you may all be familiar with the Alpha submarine and stuff. They can leave all our submarines in their dust. Um, uh, so that essentially made them want to look at all the other alternatives. The problem with that alternative is it always took an enormous infrastructure change to change the fuel design to a higher temperature, higher performing core. And so that was very expensive. So they never really moved off of that at this point. But I saw the commercial industry essentially going the same way, right? That there's nobody out there that really knows how to design reactors because we haven't really done it for 30, 40 years in that. And so I want, before I, I left Capital because I wanted to help the commercial industry in this. We are doing a molten chloride salt fast reactor. So the fuel is liquid sodium chloride, potassium chloride, and a few other chloride salts to get the melting point down primarily. Uh, but you can dissolve these, you can melt them about uh, 450 C and then dissolve the uranium salt in them or plutonium salt in them as well. Uh, and that's your fuel. Uh, in the fast spectrum of the reactor, you can burn actinides completely, so it closes the fuel salt cycle. You can essentially um, operate them for a long time period, and the fission products aren't as important because it's a fast spectrum. If you need to remove fission products, your fuel salt is already liquid, so you don't have to break it up into small pieces and then uh, uh, dissolve it in other materials. Um, and it's chlor chloride-based salt. Why chloride-based salt? The MSRE was a fluoride-based salt. Um, we're doing chloride because there's a lot more people that know how to do chloride salt chemistry. Uh, Argonne National Lab, Idaho National Lab, Sandia National Lab. Uh, it's just a much more commonly used salt. All the people that did the fluoride salt at uh, Oak Ridge, they're not there anymore. There's a lot of documentation on it, but the, there's not there. Um, also, the melting point of chloride salts is significantly lower than, than fluoride salts. And that, so, like, you had to end up using lithium fluoride and beryllium fluoride pretty much for the most of the fluoride salts. So, to get away from lithium enrichment, which was a weapons concern, we went to the chloride salts and got there by using the lower melting point. Uh, reactor power levels um, were very flexible. Um, uh, 125 to 2500 megawatts thermal pictured on this picture is a 250 megawatt plant that specifically was used to check to see if it would fit on a ship for a ship power and yes ship power for commercial shipping is like 50 megawatts electric um, this one's 250 megawatts electric so five times as much power which means it can go 70 percent or 70 to 100 percent faster so deliveries that much faster um, electrical capacity, we've looked at 50 to 1,000 a, a megawatts electric, one gigawatt electric, but the limitation on what power you can get out of it is really not the reactor vessel, because reactor vessel is the same regardless of what power, because we barely have enough fuel in there to stay critical all the time. I don't have any of the fuel, anything in the core that's damaged, um, so it doesn't really matter, and there's no pressure drop in the core because there's no channels or anything like that. It's just an open core. Um, so it, it, what controls the power rating? What, how many heat exchangers you can fit around the core? That's what controls it, right? So if I have a tiny little heat exchanger, I can m make you know, 50 megawatts electric pretty easily. But uh, if I want to get 
2,000 megawatts electric, fitting enough heat exchanger around the core is, is going to be the challenge. And you don't want really big loops like you have in water, uh, because it all, the, all those loops contain fuel salt and fission products. Uh, core outlet temperatures, um, our first start was at 600 Celsius. 600 Celsius is based on using uh, standard stainless steel materials, so we can build it today. Those are already nuclear qualified. A lot of companies are talking about Hasselhoi N material. That's not qualified today, and those can go up to 700 C, but we wanted to build today. Uh, but we are looking at configurations, and that'll be on the next slide, able to go up to 1000 C using conventional materials for the containment boundaries. And that last part is important because containment boundaries means those are the boundaries that you leak. It's basically just like a gas reactor. You cool all the containment boundaries with T-cold. And you keep T-cold low enough. So 500 C inlet temperatures, that's if you have the 600 C temperature uh, outlet version. Uh, that's limited by the freezing point of the salt. You need some margin. Uh, we have no moderator in the conventional sense that you take it thermal because we're a fast reactor. I'm biased, I think all matter is a moderator. In other words, neutrons are born at over 2 MeV and somehow they get moderated to 1 MeV to 100 keV, even in fast reactors. And so that, in my view, is still a moderator because there's a large spectrum that you can go through in fast reactors. Operating pressure, low. Why, do I say, why don't I say atmospheric? Well, the issue is you have to force the flow through a heat exchanger. So you need some kind of pressure to get the flow through the heat exchanger, and that is a pressure drop. This is the three types of reactors, and it, it may not mesh with your conventional sense of what people are calling modular reactors today. This was around before that, right? The first one is a loop where you have pipes between all the components. That's conventional light water reactor style. The middle one is basically a modular style. Right, which means the heat exchangers and the pumps are mounted directly off the reactor with very short pipes so you don't have the, the uh, pipe break loca concern, but it gives you a lot more heat transfer area to remove, which is why we're looking at that. And because it allows us to easily replace the heat exchangers compared to having it in the vessel. I don't want to have to open the vessel if I don't have to. Um, the third kind is what most of the SMRs are today, at least the water reactors, is an integral reactor where the core and the heat exchangers are all in the vessel. Technically, BWRs are all integral reactors to start off because they, they create the heat in the core and they con convert to steam in the vessel. All right? uh, but all the small water reactors are, all, are almost all of this integral style. All right? What's the problem with that integral style? Well, basically, if you want to do anything to the core region, you have to remove all the heat exchangers, control rods, and everything above it. That makes it expensive to do maintenance. All right, so that's why, that's why I didn't really want to go there. The other thing is um, integral reactors are fine if you're doing very, very low power and stuff, but the size of the vessel is limited by the heat exchange area. So if you, go to, you want to go to any higher power, you have to blow out the vessel to get the heat transfer area. So it's not really the core being small that's really limiting. It's the heat exchanger area. So enrichments, uh, this is for molten salt reactors in general. There are several companies that are looking at uranium-235, less than 5% enrichment. Most of the molten salt reactors are looking at what's called HLEU, something between 5 and less than 20% enrichment. Uh, and, and the reason for that is that uh, in the thermal reactors in particular, the fission product buildup will essentially start absorbing all your neutrons and you need higher enrichment uh, to be able to make up for that. Um, lithium-6, lithium-7, a lot of the, uh, the thermal reactors, um, like the uh, thorium-containing reactors uh, and some of the rest, in order to get the melting point down, they need to use lithium because lithium Fluoride is one of the lowest melting salts that there are in the fluorides. The, why the fluorides? The fluorine uh, absorbs neutrons less than chlorine does. Uh, so a thermal reactor, you would tend to want to use the lithium fluoride to reduce the melting point. Problem is, lithium-6 has an enormous absorption cross-section, so you have to really clean it out of that. And you need almost pure lithium-7, 99.997 or 0.995% pure, right? That's very expensive. The other issue is when you enrich lithium-7, you enrich lithium-6, and that's a weapons material. 
Uh, so I have concerns uh, over specifically doing that. Um, if you end up with lithium-7 being made in a weapon state, that's fine, I guess, but you wouldn't want any state necessarily uh, making the lithium-7. Chlorine-37, um, in the fast reactors, most of them are uh, sodium chloride based, so chlorine. Um, the chlorine-35 is a, a bigger absorber than chlorine-37, so enriching the chlorine-37 is a benefit to the reactor design, absorbs less neutrons. Um, and you can do that. Chlorine was the first isotope ever enriched. Uh, you can enrich it. So Westinghouse is working on a process for zerc chloride enrichment or zirconium enrichment. And when they do that, they use the zerc chloride. And by virtue of that, they get 70% enriched uh, chlorine 37 out of that process. So we could use that as a process. Chlorine 37 enrichment, you only need somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 to 95% enrichment, so you don't need the very high enrichment that you had for lithium-6 because <coughs> chlorine-35 absorption cross-section is fairly low. Uh, but chlorine, a uh, zerc chloride melts at 300 C, so it's a very high temperature enrichment. And that's fine if you want to get zerc, but we can enrich chlorine at, with HCl at room temperature. Uh, so this is our, our uh, the uh, Elysium uh, primary fuel cycle. Uh, we went th down this road because when we started going into fast reactor, you need a lot of fuel for a fast reactor, no matter what it is. Plus, now you have half your fuel outside the core, and we have no in-core in -core structure to displace any of the fuel in the core. So our fuel volumes were getting pretty high and expensive. Right? So even though our reactor could go to any power, it didn't really matter, we were kind of limited to the high power range because of the cost of our initial fuel and how long did it take to pay that back. So we were at the one gigawatt electric range. And then I realized that uh, the, if we started with the uh, uranium uh, size, uh, uranium fuel, not only did you have to have uh, uh, like 15% enriched, stuff to start it up, you had to feed in 20% enriched for five to 10 years, decreasing over the years until you could use natural, but you were converting to a plutonium cycle. So I said, well, why don't I just start with a plutonium cycle? Because there's plenty of plutonium in the world that we need to get rid of at this point, including weapons and uh, already sep separated plutonium. And that gets me back, basically started at my base chemistry. So I don't have to worry about changing chemistry, changing neutronics over the years. And I get rid of a lot of waste material that people don't want. So that's, that's one of the things I said, right? Trying to solve some of the nuclear issues today, burning spent nuclear fuel and burning plutonium waste that people don't want or would like to see it get rid of. Um, so we would use uh, like weapons grade or reactor grade plutonium at 10%. If uh, we had uh, uranium, we would need 15% because it's a, not as good a fuel. And then we'd have 90% um, spent nuclear fuel. So startup of the reactor is going to need over 70 tons of spent nuclear fuel just to get it started. And after that, you're going to build, you're going to burn about one uh, metric ton per year. And that one metric ton is assuming one gigawatt. So if you had a lower power, it'd take longer to do that, and higher power would take shorter. So we're consuming spent nuclear fuel at that rate, right? Uh, and I have another, so uh, the question of a blanket, that's an optional thing. That's a little bit harder to try to show safeguards because the flux is lower in a blanket, but it would improve your breeding ratio if you were uh, using that. Um, and I already started to say this, we can burn just about any actinide. So weapons grade, reactor grade, plutonium, spent nuclear fuel, depleted uranium, all waste products. So why, does, why do we now have a low power option? Well, these are all things that people are paying to store and that are essentially safeguards concerns because of the possible access. And as certainly as some of the spent nuclear fuel decays, you lose some of the protective mechanisms over the, you know, over 100 years or so, right? So, that be, so consuming that would be a good thing. Not that I think it's a really concern, but it is certainly a political concern for doing that. So we can consume those. Uh, depleted uranium, people are paying good money to store that. Um, and so that be basically I see as an opportunity. 
I see that. So right now, nuclear is, is not doing well because of the limited income that they get uh, relative to the cost of production or the cost of operation. This is a new revenue stream that will help improve the economics of the reactors and provide a society benefit as well. Um, I hesitated to put this last one on there, meltdown fuel and stuff, um, but TMI, uh, Fukushima, and all those, there's a possibility if we can get rid of a lot of the stuff that got melted into it, out of it, then we could consume that waste as well. But that's gonna be more expensive, and, and you'll see why in a second, because spent nuclear fuel is real easy. Um, Spent, so I, I talked about spent nuclear fuel burn up rate. So light water reactors burn about 4% of the, of the uranium that's in it. In a molten chloride fast reactor, we close the cycle, we can burn 96%. So that's basically 24 times as much power out of the mind, or excuse me, out of the spent nuclear fuel than was originally obtained out of that. And then we're op at the 1,000 C temperature range, we're operating about 50% uh, efficiency and light water reactors are 33. So we get another um, uh, 1.3, 1.4 kicker on the amount of power produced. So it's about 36 times as much. Um, so if you assume light water reactors operate for 50 years, I think we're maybe up to 40 years today, just the spent nuclear fuel consumption and stuff would still take us 1800 years to use it if we used it at today's rate. Right, if we went to 100% power, this is kind of uh, like for the US and stuff, we're at 20%. If you went to 100%, it'd take 360 years to burn all the spent fuel. If you started using process heat, there's a lot of process heat. I just put a less than 100 years, but it'd be a lot less than 100 years just to burn the spent fuel out there. But that assumes a complete conversion to a closed cycle. Like this. And there's also uh, about eight to 10 times as much depleted uranium out there, right? So that's, multiply by 10 is the easy math, that that fuel will last of already mined stuff that's out there. So hopefully there aren't too many uranium miners in here. All right, so why do I say this is easy? This is our process for generating new fuel, all right? On the left, you can see the fuel cells, the uh, light water reactor fuel cell or a can-do fuel cell. Uh, we basically take it through a chopping process, which is already done in France and Japan and a few other countries, full cell fuel chopping, chop it into like two centimeter lengths, right? We take a vat of our carrier salt, the sodium chloride, uh, potassium chloride and, and another and stuff. And that one other thing that I mentioned in there will react out the oxides. So it'll steal the oxygen from the uranium, the plutonium, the higher actinides, and most of the fission products. The gases will off gas. The noble metals will not react to chlorides. They're insoluble in chlorides. That's about 30% of the fission products that you will have coming out of it. But all the actinides and most of the fission products stay in there. Uh, and at, at that point, you basically just have suspended solids in a fuel salt and you filter out the, uh, the suspended solids out of there and you have a fuel. Well, wait, wait a minute, one other thing. Uh, for startup fuel, you need that 10% of plutonium. So you need to add that. But that also reacts with the other chloride to become part of the fuel salt. Um, from a proliferation standpoint, right? So if we use weapons grade plutonium to do this, this process essentially will combine it with about 10 times as much spent nuclear fuel. So the plutonium in the spent nuclear fuel denatures the plutonium in the weapons grade plutonium to get the plutonium 240 to greater than 10%, right? So that means it's not weapons grade. I understand that that's not, doesn't mean you can't make a weapon out of it, but certainly is being used as the standard for how do you get rid of weapons grade plutonium today, is to get greater than 10% 240. So, why is that important? Plutonium, weapons grade plutonium is hard to ship. It is very hard to ship, right? So if I can get it below weapons grade plutonium status, then I can ship it basically as spent fuel at this point. Um, and, and that makes things a lot easier. So that essentially, this fuel production, if you do it in weapons grade, has to be done at a Cat 1 security facility, right? But once that's done, then you drop to the next grade for fuel and spent fuel 
shipping. Um, so that reduces the cost in the long run. But in the, in the meantime, instead of like the United States is talking about uh, making MOX fuel out of their weapons grade plutonium, sticking it in a light water reactor and burning it for a few years to get the, this denaturing and stuff. We do it in the fuel production process. They do not. All right, so then you filter it. We, since it's a salt, we don't really care about the decay heat too much. It's easy to remove. We don't boil until 1400 C. <laughs> so we have lots of margin in that. So it's easy to cool, much lower heat transfer area. And so if you compare this to other processes for what you call reprocessing, all right, the pure X process to get plutonium out today is thousands of chemical steps, very expensive. A lot of places for pulling out the plutonium separately. As a matter of fact, it's specifically geared towards separating the plutonium. The pyro processing is about seven chemical steps. It doesn't clean the plutonium out as well. Um, but it still kind of separates the uranium and the plutonium from each other and most of the fission products. Right? This process doesn't intentionally remove anything. We've had this reviewed by the NNSA already and they have said that this is not reprocessing because you don't separate anything. Right? You still have the fission products in there protecting it and all the actinides are all mixed together. We don't separate uranium and plutonium at all. Um, so that's a benefit. All right, this is apropos that this was scheduled today because this is a picture of the hot lab at INL. They are today starting to convert spent nuclear fuel, actually MOX fuel, into chloride fuel as a demonstration product process. All right, so I am very excited to do this. We did this for $300,000. So if you want to think, well, how much does it take to make fuel? $300,000 to do a demo is pretty cheap for making fuel this and so that's that starts today it'll probably take a couple weeks because uh, we want to do it slow to make sure we understand what, what's going on um, so th that was very exciting and this is the DOE gain funding that allows us to do this and that's in collaboration with Argonne National Lab and Idaho National Lab and Elysium Industries through the game project um, so why did I call this a demo instead of a proof of principle well, this is already an existing patent out in the world about how to do this. We just adapted that existing patent for doing it with specifically with spent fuel. All right, so this is already, already public information. Um, we already know that it will work, right? So we don't need a proof of principle. We need a demo project that's basically going to show the world and the government and the regulator that you can convert spent fuel into chloride fuel without doing reprocessing, without cons con generating proliferation uh, <coughs> concerns for it. That's a big deal, especially when you're putting it into a closed fuel cycle. Because if I start with plutonium, I don't need to add fissile material ever again. Now, technically, when I'm adding spent nuclear fuel, yes, I'm adding fissile. But I can adapt to that because we're getting rid of the spent fuel. All right, um, so, the, the on, so do we do any um, online reprocessing? Because we're a fast reactor and stuff, the fission product cross-section is much lower than the fission cross-section, right? So we are not as sensitive to fission product loading. So we certainly don't need to uh, separate out fission products as much. But we came, uh, we came up with a process initially that's basically two chemistry steps that separates out that first line. Uh, well, gases come out, all right, um, on a regular basis. That's easy. The noble metals come out um, on a regular basis. They'll plate out or you'll filter them out, all right? So I don't have to actively do anything to do that except for have the system for removing that. But chemical processing is what people are usually concerned about, all right? So what do you do for that? So that, um, that under the soluble fission products, that's the chemistry processing. So that first line of chemistry processing are the things that we actually actively remove. That second line, the other soluble fission products and actinides that remain in the fuel salt, <coughs> because we're using chloride salts, we can separate some of the fission products but not others. And why is that? Well, the, the second line down at the bottom um, right here, those are the ones that kind of look like actinides chemically in chloride salts. 
All right, so we specifically set our processing system up so that you can't separate actinides and that prevents us from being able to pull out these cesiums and strontiums. So they're gonna be in with the fuel for with 30 year half-life for a very long time. So you're always gonna have a major protectant in the fuel if you do this. So we haven't had this reviewed with NNSA to determine whether this is reprocessing. It's a much harder sell to say it's not reprocessing, but it does a really bad job of separating fission products out. So you always have uranium, plutonium, and, act and uh, fission products in there protecting them, right? It's still, it's still better than so a pyro processing or purex processing in that. And you have the protection for as long as you do for light water reactor fuel in these. So very good deal on that. So we looked at this and we said, well, two things, right? One is people still may perceive, since we're doing chemical work at all, that this is reprocessing, right? And it's hard to say that it's not reprocessing when you do separate things out, right? The other issue is if you put this, we were talking about putting this on every single plant, right? Because there's just two chemical steps to be able to do this, right? So it was very easy, so we can do it on each plant. And since we're only pulling out these materials and stuff and not the actinides, you could actually mine for medical isotopes and that sort of thing because it doesn't have actinides in it, All right? But, it's, but having that system on the plant means you have to build that, you have to maintain it, and you have to train, peop train people to use it. That's cost, All right? Big goal of our project is to reduce the cost of these plants. And then from a perception point of view, are all these plants doing reprocessing? So we said the other option is we can operate the plant for 40 to 100 years because fission products aren't as important to us without this system for removing any of the soluble fission products. And there's lots of options and knobs to turn on that. That's why I give the range of 40 to 100 years. 40 years is kind of like, well, that's how long the vessel's gonna last. You have to replace that anyhow, so why not do this at the same time? Um, but if I do that, then I can just basically dump the fuel, all right, at let's say 40 years, all right, and pump a new fuel in that came from the fuel production facility and start right back up, all right? I let this cool because I, need, I have another 40 years until I need another fuel load, all right? So I let this cool for a while, then I send it as essentially spent fuel to a production facility that will do the, 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 uh, the separations in the same manner, it, it does a bad job, but I'm gonna say let's, let's try to get a, like 90% of the fission products out. That way the uranium, plutonium, and higher actinides are still protected by 10% fission products, preferably cesium and strontium, uh, because it's long-term, and get rid of the rest of the fission products, and then it's only 10% as opposed to say 40% after 40 or 50 years of operations. Um, so that's good fuel again. All right, if you're doing a uh, uh, iso breeding or something like that, then you're gonna want to split that fuel and put it into more than one reactor. Because you have, with uh, iso breeding, you actually have to breed a little bit more fuel than what you burn, uh, just to make up for the fission product buildup. All right, so, you, so that'll actually be fuel for multiple reactors, if you're doing that. Or you could do positive breeding, um, where you're actually making more fuel, and I'll get into that later. But that's pretty exciting that we can do something without separating out the actinides and the fission products. Um, I talked about a lot about this already. Um, all right, so the one sad thing that I have is the strontium and the cesium would be make great uh, uh, heat sources um, for like photoelectric or thermophotovoltaic devices or Stirling engines as a power source. Um, but uh, I will forgo that if that is needed to protect the, the fuel. All right, so what, what, so what happens with this material? So because the cesium and the strontium stay with the fuel, right, they are then converted to short-lived or stable, right? So the, the strontium and the cesium have 27 to 30 year half-lives, right? So that lasts, you know, roughly uh, 300 years, right? That's what gives, the fission products from light water reactor fuel the 300 year lifetime if you don't have the actinides in it, right? But we're only pulling out the short-lived stuff, so that's only on the order of 100 years, 
right? So we have, we're working with uh, MIT to develop, well, how would we convert our chloride waste fission products into uh, glass, uh, either uh, borosilicate glass or phosphate glass and stuff. But that assumes that the actinides are still in there, that you need to stabilize it for a very long time. Again, cost, right? That's gonna be expensive to do that. But if I only last 100 years, I don't really need to do that, all right? I can do something much more simple like spent fuel casts, which will last 100 years fairly easily. Um, I started talking about breeding ratios. The three different breeding uh, regimes are basically the burners, where you, do, you make less fuel than you, uh, um, than you burn, like light water reactors, the breeding ratio is about 0.6. Um, the, for the other one is ISO breeders, and everybody says it's 1.0, but it's, it's not 1.0, it's 1.0 plus a little bit to make up for the fission product buildup for a practical reactor. Um, and that's basically you just operate and you don't pull out anything. And the third one, uh, and, and basically those first two, as you burn up the fissile and the fertile, the temperature of the reactor will start dropping because you burned out its fuel, all right? And as the temperature starts, the temperature drops because it needs to pour, pull more fissile into the core to keep it operating, right? And the lower density means more fuel gets pulled in. That's how molten salt reactors work. Uh, so that's how you would operate that. So, but a breeder, on the other hand, is making more fissile than it's actually burning, right? So as the temperature of the, as, as the, you breed more fuel, the temperature of the reactor will tend to increase slowly. So you need to do something. You either, the typical, what everybody says, is you need to pull out the actinides, all right? We don't want to do that, all right? To bring the, the temperature back down, all right? But, be, but what you can also can do is essentially dilute it. You can dilute it with fertile. You can do it, dilute it with carrier salt, all right? So that keeps everything totally mixed. So again, trying to design away a solution to the problem. So we don't have separated actinides, we don't have separated uranium, plutonium, that sort of thing. So when you add just carrier salt and stuff, you're putting clean carrier salt and just diluting the fuel so you have less fuel in the core, less fissile in the core, but everything is still mixed all the time. When you go around the loop, everything stays totally mixed. You have stuff in expansion tank, but you circulate that through the core too. Um, I think I carried all, covered all this. So the one, the one, one point here is if you're doing a breeding mode, even if you're doing the, the burner or ISO breeding mode, you need expansion space to add the additional fertile. Uh, in this particular case, since you're diluting it with additional salt, you need expansion space or dump tank space to have that expanded volume going in there. So that's gonna be a little bit of a difference. All right, so separate, so Basically, separate as before, all right? Remove 90% of the fission products at a breeding rate. Let's say you had a breeding ratio of 1.5. So by the end of life, you would have increased the carrier salt by, what is that, about 30% or so in there to dilute down the fissile material, right? But then you, you still go out and you separate 90% of the fission products, right? But you're gonna have, you know, after 40 years at a 1.5 breeding ratio, you're gonna have quite a lot of of fissile material, so you're going to separate out 90% of the fission products, but now you, ha you definitely have to split the fuel into multiple cores. So that's one of the ways you can take one core, feed it back to the original core, uh, assuming the timing is right, and the other core, the other fissile, you can ship to another reactor. But as you can see, we don't separate uranium and plutonium for doing that. And that's, like I said, intended to be able to solve the political and emotional concerns associated with separating materials. Um, so, what, why, is, why are we different? Why wasn't this done before? Um, and the issue is really solid fuel. When you do reprocessing of solid fuel, the reason why you have to pull all the fission products out and separate the plutonium and uranium is, your plutonium and uranium is partly because you build up poisons that you can't separate, so you need the two separate to only put the plutonium back in as mox. But in general, you need to be able to handle those materials 
in a cost-effective manner to build solid fuel. So it's all about building solid fuel that drives the fact that you had to have really clean fuels. But if you have liquid fuels and stuff, you can do this all remote. It's all clean, right? right? You don't have people running around in these spaces and the processes are very simple so you can do it remotely for these. And you don't have to have, we'll call it a perfect, very tight tolerance fuel production facility and inspection facility. You can do chemical process. You can do uh, laser, laser induced um, breakdown um, spectrometry and figure out what the compositions of all the materials are. And you can do that without actually having to pull a sample out. You can just run it by a window and test it. Um, so you don't need that very tight interaction. Um, so a lot of, a lot of uh, countries and stuff are interested in thorium. I'm not so interested in thorium because I can burn spent fuel and plutonium and stuff like that. Um, but a lot of countries are. And the, the, this, this is a picture showing, uh, the, so the first curve is um, neutron induced fission cross section. Um, and you can see in there that the, in the fast spectrum where the red line is, the, the, uh, all the fission spectrums are about the same. The two lines coming up from the bottom are the uranium-238, which is the blue line, and the black line is the thorium-232, fast fission cross-sections. So when you, so thermal reactors, you cannot get fast fission, or not, very, not enough to be significant. But in a fast reactor, you can get the blue line for the uranium-238, you get 10% of your power from fast fission of 238. That saves a neutron. Um, and the black one for thorium, you only get 5%. Right? So you can do it. And you can do it, actually, you can do thorium better in a fast reactor than you can in a thermal reactor because you have more neutrons per fission in that. The curve on the right is basically the neutrons per fission, not counting the fast fission portion and stuff. As you can see, the plutonium 239 is about 2.9 neutrons per fission, just to start and then you add the fast fissions of 238, you're up to 3 to 3.1 neutrons per fission. That gives you the ability to not be concerned about leakage, absorption of materials, uh, and breeding. So you have enough fissions to breed. Why is that important? If you want to burn acnides, some of those are fertile, right? You have to convert those to fissile to consume them in most cases. Right, so you need that extra neutron economy. So if somebody tells you that you can burn actinides in a thermal reactor, you can do it, but it is very, very slow. You really, because you don't have the extra neutrons per fission. As you can see in the left-hand side of this graph over here, um, the extra neutrons are very low. You need the extra neutrons to essentially convert, the, convert those higher actinides. So you can do it. You can do thorium in our, in our reactor in a fast reactor, excuse me, I apologize for that. Um, but plutonium is much better and plutonium has all this waste material that we can consume. The thorium option, all right, so um, a lot of people are looking at the pure thorium cycle where you make th have thorium and you convert it to uranium-233. You don't have a source of fuel today for doing that pure cycle. Um, so one, you have to overcome that. You have to breed uranium-233 in a blanket. The problem is uranium-233 is pure fissile, 100%, right? So that's a concern. Uh, the main thing that people usually say that want, want to do that is, well, you also breed uranium-232 in there. And when uranium-232 decays off to uh, uh, I forget what the decay chain is. It's right here. The uranium-233 decays to thorium-229, uh, which then alpha decays further down. One of those lower down things emits a high gamma, which gives you a protection mechanism for thorium. But it is still HEU. It's just the radiation level coming off of it means you can't very well make it into a weapon. Right? <coughs> but if you look in uh, right here, um, PA-232 has a 1.3 day half-life and the, for making uranium-232 and PA, so I'm sorry, PA-232 has, oh, you can't even read that, can you? <laughs> um, 
well, this, this is like a 1.3 day half-life and this is like a 27 day half-life. So if you're processing out um, uranium to put in from a blanket into a core, which is what most of the, the thorium cycles do, they have a blanket, then all you need to do is take that out of the flux, right? Let it decay for like seven days and all the 232 will have already decayed away. So you just do another uranium extract extraction at that point, all the 232 is gone, all your protectant is gone, and you're left with pure uranium-233 that is very long half-life. It's uh, 10 to the fifth year half-life. So you can handle that fairly well. All right, so that's, that's my concern with thorium, right? Because there are ways to separate it. And you, can, you can say, or maybe I cover this. All right, um, you can, so this, this is kind of like, there's two different ways of doing that. You can say, I'm gonna do a single fluid or you can say where you, you don't have a blanket where you're extracting it, or I'm gonna mix it with uranium-238, all right, and denature it. Uh, first of all, um, caveat, you need uh, less than 12% uh, uranium-233 to be equivalent to the less than 20% that you normally see for uranium-235, all right, because uranium-233 is a better fissile material than uranium-235. All right, so what do, you, what do you do? So if you're doing processing to pull out fission products from a thermal reactor because they really care about fission products because their cross sections are higher, you can pull out protactinium, All right? Once you pull out protactinium, you do the process that I said earlier is let, let it decay out of, outside of the flux and separate out the uranium-232, the uranium-232 decays away, then separate the uranium out again and you have the reactor grade again. So what do you do? Well, can do's have a, are basically similar. So if you have the uranium-238 mixed in, you can basically say, don't do reprocessing at all, right? And when, you, when the core is done operating, like uh, terrestrial energy and, and Thorcon, they're operating seven or eight years, then you, you shut down the core and you either you dump it out or you just leave it in the pot, right? You would have somebody there for inspection for doing that. And then if you left it sit for about a year, then all the uranium-233 and your uranium-232 would have all decayed away, right? The uranium-233 would have uh, decayed, or excuse me, the, the protactinium-233 would have all decayed away to uranium-233, but it's mixed with uranium-238. Right, so now it's denatured. So after a year of storage, then you're basically no different than light water reactor fuel with regard to that. So as long as you have inspection when the core is dumped or removed when people are trying to access it, and then you make sure that it's not pulled out in the intervening year after shutdown of that core, then you're basically no different than a light water reactor. All right, so there are ways to get thorium to work but the best way is if you have it denatured with 238. But you still gotta watch it its entire life. But we do that with can do's today. All right, uh, I already mentioned these. Um, terrestrial energy uses denatured molten salt. Uh, as a denatured molten salt, that means it's uranium-238 with 235, in this case, with less than 5%. But it only lasts for eight years, and then the, the reactor vessel entirely is, is stored. Uh, so it's not dumped or anything. Um, Thorcon is another uh, company that does, um, they're using 19.75% enriched uh, U U-235, and they do that because they're adding more fertile thorium in there because they're doing a mixed thorium-uranium cycle. That has certain spectral benefits and fission product, or excuse me, um, long-term actinide benefits if you assume that you have an open fuel cycle like that. So you produce less actinides in that because you use the thorium as part of your energy, but you de still denature it with uranium-238. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, there, but in large part, the thorium is, there's a Southeast Asian stuff, they want to use thorium. They're, they have thorium, they don't have uranium. Um, I, I can't get excited about that because as, you show, as I showed earlier, 
all these countries or a lot of these countries already have uranium spent fuel and if I can pull 30 times as 36 times as much energy out of that spent fuel as they are to use then the cost of buying new fuel is is kind of immaterial if you can pull uranium out of seawater for twice the cost of current mining and you have a coastline if if my fuel cost is 36 times lower then what is what is a factor of two increase in fuel cost for your getting the uranium so the, the thorium is kind of like I view it as a uh, kind of a sales pitch but it's kind of based on solid fuel biases today <coughs> what was that the last one I think it was I guess so let me go back up to a more eye candy <laughs> so are there any questions one of the issues with spent fuel is when is it spent fuel and when is it not meaning how much radiation is there basically protecting the material. Say, we're looking at what we call direct use material, plutonium or HEU. Yes. If there's radiation there at a high enough level, then we assume that gives us, there's a time that it takes to cool down, it has to be worked with remotely, we process all of that, so there's time. Now, if it looks like it's a direct use material unirradiated where there's not any irradiation. What I see what you're trying to do is you're doing what they would say is recycling because you're never removing that. Right. So do you see any point where the radiation levels on the fuel get to the point where it might be too low? We were talking for conventional light water reactor fuel? Well we were talking or our fuel. Well, we're trying to figure out one of the things we've been looking at in our section is the definition of what spent fuel is right. and, and what is radiated and we were thinking at one say that there was a one meter 500 r per hour and the other number has always been physical protection 100 r per hour at one meter some fellows did, did a paper on this 25 years ago and said we'll call anything that's 25 50 r per hour spent fuel so, can you give me any idea where your material sits on that scale? Is it always going to be about 500, 100 R per hour at one meter, or is it going to be even hotter or lower? It, this, is, this is going to be not significantly different than existing spent fuel, except for the fact that the stuff that we pull out is going to tend to concentrate the shorter lived stuff. So, generally, the stuff that we're going to put into a waste stream is going to be much hotter than spent fuel because it's not diluted by their zirconium, the space, the actinides, the actinides is essentially being stable and stuff, essentially decrease the spent fuel and shield it. All right. In our case, we're pulling out the shortest lived stuff. That's going to be the hottest stuff. So it's not even the cesium and stuff like that that are limiting you. It's the, it's the really short lived that are going to be the hottest stuff. Okay, so you're looking basically at no point where you're going to have something in a bucket that somebody can just walk away with. That's correct. You're thinking like dirty bombish. And no, no, I mean so just to do, you have fissile material that is so has so such low radiation that it's basically can be take, taken away. Correct, but don't forget we're not pulling out actinides, so it won't have actinides. In this, in this, in the one that we're doing. That's an issue. Of how how we take a look at this cycle all the way through what the, the fuel what the reactor is going to be like what the storage material would be like later so that, that's an issue right the, well and that and that's a, a question on our part so existing spent fuel and stuff has a specific shape and it has a specific heat and it has a specific cooling capability right whether it's can do or light water reactor they're a little bit different and stuff like that but they have a very specific set shape and it's always going to be wasted in that shape all right so whether you cool it or not it's always going to have that size all right when we have essentially uh, uh, liquid waste all right our stuff you can have at a certain density and if you wanted to put it into long-term storage for instance and stuff 
you can do that. You're going to have to probably dilute it to the same level of spent nuclear fuel if you want to use the same size containers. The advantage of having these shorter lived stuff is you can let it decay away and the waste volume actually goes down as you let it cool. So uh, like light water reactor is, is goes into dry storage after five years, can do goes into storage after 10 years for different reasons and stuff like that. But if you let ours decay for 30 or 50 years, unlike light water reactor fuel without the longer lived stuff in it, ours decays way faster. You can bury it in a smaller package than you could. Two questions on when and where. When is your best estimate to deploy this? Um, having gotten the regulatory reviews and so on, and where, as in, would you need to have the countries redefine what they consider spent fuel or spent fuel declared as waste to go through with this fuel? The first question, the when, right? The long pole is not the technology. The long pole is getting the policy changed the access to the spent fuel, the access to the plutonium, and the regulatory space for it. For instance, light water reactor fuel, light water reactors in the United States are approximately a six year regulatory space, even if it's a well known thing. Right? Even if it's a low source thing, like a small modular reactor, it's six years. In Canada, it's 11 years. Right? So we don't really have a technology basis. The thing that usually makes new, new reactors take a very long time to develop is the fuel qualification and testing. Right? So, so, and, but that's all, again, based on solid fuel, right? You make a solid fuel, you predict what it's going to do, you stick it in a reactor, you irradiate it, you burn it up. That takes years. All right? You pull it out and it didn't do what you expected it to do, so you modify it and do that again. That's another a couple of years. Like uh, Triso fuel, I think it's taking like 40 years to qualify. But if you think about it, all right, we don't have a solid fuel. We don't have a failure point in the way that solid fuel is going to release fission products. All right, we're already liquid. All right, so all the damage that our fuel happens to our fuel is based on it goes into the core, it gets irradiated, it changes character around the loop, and it comes back into the core and it gets irradiated. Right. That's essentially the damage that occurs in the fuel. So you can irradiation test our fuel in a matter of months, right? not many decades. Right? So that's the long pole that like the sodium reactors, lead reactors, and stuff like that usually face. A lot of that's already been done for those reactors. But people say, uh, just assume that molten salt reactors are the same. We are clearly not. And that's a question that, uh, that uh, we have to overcome with how to do that. Where do you install it? All right. Our intent is to basically try to um, glom on to the PMDA agreement in the United States, where they have a bunch of plutonium that they have an agreement with Russia to get rid of, 34 tons of weapons grade plutonium that they have to get rid of. Uh, and right now, the MOX production has stopped. So we're in violation of that agreement. In my opinion, that's not the US government's opinion. Sorry. <laughs> but anyhow, um, we can do that. And as I s explained earlier, we can do that just in the fuel production process. We don't even need to put it in the reactor to get rid of that like the, the MOX process does. So shipping plutonium is hard, right? So we just build a fuel production plant at Savannah River and essentially convert that MOX into our fuel. They have spent fuel there already that we can use for denaturing and uh, giving our fertile that we need. And um, according to the NRC, they will license a less than 10 megawatts thermal reactor in one year, molten salt. That's what they claim, and because the source term is so low. So because we don't have shipping containers for what would be characterized as liquid fuel, albeit it would be frozen when you ship it, um, we don't have shipping containers for that. France does, but it would have to be qualified in the United States for doing that, all right? So build the plant at Savannah River is what our current target is right now. Um, but, um, and then get that. But I, one of the things that you'll, you'll remember that I said, this reactor, this portion of it is the same, regardless 
of whether it's 10 megawatts thermal or 2,500 megawatts thermal because there's no pressure drop in there. So all we do is use that same reactor vessel right there um, for the prototype and just attach a teeny weeny little heat exchanger and pump on there, right, to get the 10 megawatts out. Probably dump it. The question of whether you can get enough heat out of a 10 megawatts thermal compared to just environmental losses of heat, uh, I, that I haven't looked at yet. But basically build a reactor vessel so that you can upgrade it. So while you're doing the testing at the 10 megawatts thermal and under regime, you apply for an uprate license from 10 megawatts to say 250 megawatts, and then 250 to 500 megawatts. And all that, it, all that it means is you replace that little heat exchanger with a big heat exchanger or multiple big heat exchangers until you get up to the power that you need. And you're basically bootstrapping it, but you're using the same reactor that you did for the low power thing. So that's, that's kind of our first target more broadly. Um, getting rid of spent fuel is a motivating th factor for a lot of countries. So countries that have spent fuel to get rid of would be initial targets. Countries that have plutonium to get rid of would be initial targets because they have motivation that improves the funding. Once these reactors are going though, as you saw, they can produce their own fuel. As a matter of fact, one of the things that I didn't say in the spent fuel uh, regime is if a country has a lot of spent fuel and you have the plutonium and stuff you can actually export that stuff as fuel to countries that don't have spent nuclear fuel and don't have plutonium um, so uh, whether or not it came through a reactor or you denatured weapon stuff or other plutonium um, you could ship it out as new fuel policy change required absolutely we need to start because the whole goal of this is to drive cost of electricity down and, 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 and clean up the environment. And so uh, in order to do that, we need to get it into countries other than those that already have nuclear power. But that is, is kind of a bootstrap method of getting there. We are looking at other ways of getting uh, plutonium out of spent fuel that doesn't require clean separation like they do today, uh, but that's still developmental. Hey, excuse me. Yes. yes. Yes, yeah, so when uh, you will have a plant that's 1,000 megawatts or so running, I see that uh, as uh, the fuel is liquid, of course uh, there is no way to count it or measure it. Uh, uh, measure. So what, uh, what is the provision? Because there should be uh, always some, uh, some way of taking some of the fuel for chemical analysis or so. Right. So how can we prevent that the fuel is not removed uh, for with bad intentions? in the small amounts and then the plutonium separated. Well, one, you don't allow extraction. You can ra basically run for 40 or 100 years without, without extraction. So if you build in capability of not extracting anything without having uh, IAEA cameras or something like that, uh, monitoring and seeing that, or locks, IAEA locks on there, then you can control that. Two, Kendu already does that. Right? Can do already extracts fuel on a regular basis. That's inspected. Now, the other thing. It's difficult uh, to, to save our candu reactors compared with. Correct. You, you can still can't count can do's. That's the technological thing. So, um, we're, we are looking at, and there's, there's probably multiple ways of doing this, of the ability to put a window in the reactor vessel that can take the temperatures of the reactor, right? But it's a window, right? And you put a window up in the bulkhead of the containment, right? You, sh you shine a laser light into that fluid and it creates a plasma of the salt in the vessel. Tiny, 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 tiny amount. So you're not affecting pressure at all, right? The emissions, so it's called uh, laser-induced breakdown spectrometry, right? And you, the emissions off of that, you can read from back outside the reactor compartment, right? So you can actually monitor the online composition of your fuel. You can do that in the dump tanks, you can do that in the reactor vessel, you can do that in the expansion tank online. So you can actually look at the compositions online. Um, so I, I, I know uh, Oak Ridge is doing that, Copenhagen Atomics in Denmark is looking at that at the moment and stuff. I'm not planning on doing that development because there are other people that are already working on that. So there are ways to do that, but 
really, you know, lock and key and camera and stuff like that are similar to existing reactors. Prevent the ability to do that as part of the safeguards. I know that's a simple one, but but that's how we do it today, right? But we can do the same thing with a molten salt reactor. But light water reactors, you pull out every 18 months. You know, if I pull it out every 50 years and stuff like that, well, as long as you can prove that nobody had access, that you're golden. So the accessibility of this core for the reactor hole. So at the commissioning stage, after the fuel is introduced, or before the fuel is introduced, would it be possible to do any DIV? I mean, how, how you know, the accessibility of this core or reactor hole? Uh, a PIE of the, the vessels? Design information verification. Um, are, are we talking about vessel inspections? Yes. During operations? Yeah, you know, I guess the, the fuel will be found. Yeah, you, you, would, you would basically drain the, the fuel to the dump tank, and then you have a flushing salt that is basically a clean salt that you flush through the vessel to clean out the residual uh, fuel salt and uh, fission products, which cleans it up enough, and, and you may, you may re-flood it with a fairly clean salt, which will later become your dump salt, all right, so that you keep it under fluid, all right? The molten salts, all of them are essentially translucent. You can see through them. Um, now, if you have fuel salt in there, you're going to have a lot of particulates and stuff like that, so maybe you can't. But the clean salts, you will be able to see through, so you will be able to do inspections inside the salt. Albeit, they're going to have to be done at high temperature to do that. Uh, you may be able to do them at uh, lower temperature um, if you can take a high red level. Uh, because you don't have your fluid providing your shielding to the surfaces and that sort of thing. So the radiation level will be high or...? It, it's going to be similar to what a light water reactor uh, levels were. Maybe a little bit higher because you don't have any shielding between the fuel and the vessel. Um, for direct irradiation activation of the structural materials. That's essentially what you're talking about, right? So yeah, it, it'll probably be a little bit higher than a light water reactor uh, component radiation level. And plus, we're a fast reactor, right? So your neutron levels are a lot higher. So compared to a light water reactor, yes, we're going to be more activated, which is why I'm suggesting you would do it under a fluid. But that's true of all water reactors, except for, or excuse me, all, all reactors, like sodium and lead and stuff like that. You would have, I'm not sure how you'd actually do it in a lead reactor, but sodium reactor, you would have to be doing uh, like ultrasonic or other methods to do your inspections and under salt as well. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate the nice turnout we got and we'll hopefully try to do this again. Ed was here mainly because he was here with a meeting for the physical model. Our physical model that we use in safeguards for updating the nuclear fuel cycle books that we put together on there, and Ed's part of the team of people, there's a number of them in the room, who have come for the second week to upgrade reactors and other neutron sources. So we've tried to get as many people that have different experiences in the field to come to this meeting from the member states. Also, we've had great cooperation from the Nuclear Engineering Department. They've come into our meetings and they have brought a lot of expertise that we have in-house, and we're, we're very Pleased to have Ed's help and also our nuclear, nuclear energy colleagues who've come in. And it's part of one of our efforts in, in safeguards in the concepts and planning division. And we're going to have some more meetings later. And one of the things I want to try to do is have some of the experts when they come in be able to present talks like this for our NMM chapter so that we can interact with them and give them ideas such as safeguards by design and they give us new technology. So thank you very much and hopefully we'll have another one of these very soon. If you're interested in finding more information, um, stop by, I'll give you a card. Um, if you're interested in uh, knowing why there's no pumps on that middle reactor, <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> this vessel out to these flanges and stuff and out to this flange is under four meters. In the United States, the road shipping size max for feeder roads into the highways 
is about uh, 4.3 meters. All right, so we wanted to keep this part road shippable. These parts are shipped separately. Um, and so they're much smaller. And so they're, they're not really a concern. Um, but uh, as you can see, this is probably, I don't, I don't remember what the outer radius of this, he told me, but I forgot. But this is probably another, uh, so if this was two meter radius and stuff, that's probably almost another two meters out to this point. These are the, these are the pipes for the secondary salt going in and out for those. You might notice right here, a silver one, that's the drain line. You need to be able to drain the fuel salt. So uh, on the MSRE, for instance, you had one drain line on the bottom of the vessel, which this one will have that too, right? But that was for seven megawatts, right? And the, the freeze seal that you would have for a seven megawatt plant is, you have to blow that up it, basically proportional to power or at least fuel salt volume. And so I don't really know if you can do a single drain and stuff, which is why we went to these modular ones with separate drains so that you can get everything drained much faster if you do that. Besides which, if you drain out here, then it's not going to the core. So you have no risk of criticality issues. Can I ask you something? Uh, Certainly. I missed a part, or maybe you didn't really talk about it, uh, about the materials in the inside, the lining of the vessel, because you, you always say, okay, you could run this reactors for a very, very long time. So how did you solve your corrosion issues, or did you solve them? Um, that's a misconception. Everybody thinks their car corrodes, therefore salt is bad. <laughs> That's not right, right? Water, hot water like PWRs is much more corrosive than fluoride salts. Chloride salts are less corrosive than fluoride salts if you keep the oxygen and water out. So the issue is people perceive of these as corrosive because of their experience in the real world, right? Even the light water reactor, if you have any salt in the light water reactor, you've got a stress corrosion cracking problem. Right? right, tiny amounts of chlorine or fluorine in that reactor, right? Tiny amounts of oxygen or water in our system are equally a problem. But if you don't have those, which you don't have that in a light water reactor, right? You don't have those chlorides in there, right? Then you don't have a corrosion problem. INL and ANL have had molten chloride salts in um, stainless steel vessels for 25 to 30 years with no corrosion. They, the, the pots were specifically intended to do corrosion tests on coupons. They couldn't get them to corrode, so they quit. They so don't, they don't use, run those. You could use fairly lightly available uh, steels. Correct. We are trying to use stainless steel available today, all right, because then we can build today, right? That limits us in temperature, though, all right? Like stainless steel is limited to about 650 C. So we would limit our operating temperature to say somewhere down around 600 C of the containment vessels, all right? So, so in this particular case, if you've got the fuel salt coming out of the reactor vessel and stuff into pipes, then th those pipes are your containment vessel, right? So T-hot has to be limited to 600 C to prevent the um, exceeding the qualified temperature for stainless steel, all right? But this reactor, is, is basically has T cold flowing over all containment surfaces, right? Does that look familiar to anybody? What kind of other kind of reactor does that? Gas reactors. Gas reactors operate at like 250 T cold with the turbines in them and then operate 750 to 950 C by keeping T cold on the containment surfaces. There is both the containment and the high pressure. Now we have low pressure, but we still have containment, right? So if I keep that hot salt off of the containment, then I'm not as concerned about the um, higher temperature salt in the inside. I just have a, like a, a thin lining because if, if hot salt leaks into, co leaks into cold salt, that's an efficiency problem, but it's not a safety problem. And the, uh, if you want to uh, drive a turbine, where would you put the interface? Uh, so if you want just a normal steam turbine. Steam turbine specifically? All right, so this heat exchanger is a salt to salt heat exchanger. Yes. So you would basically have the identical salt out in this heat exchanger on the other side of the heat exchanger as a fuel salt, except for obviously it doesn't have uranium in it. Mm -hmm. And then it would have another component like zerc chloride or aluminum chloride, probably not aluminum chloride for 
corrosion reasons and pressure reasons, right? But that system then takes the heat out, and then that system is, we'll just call it slightly radioactive. In other words, the delayed neutrons in the heat exchangers will irradiate that secondary salt, cause activation of that secondary salt, that's not very radioactive, and then you have a steam system attached at the next heat exchanger boundary outside of the flux fields, okay. all right, that you then boil, this, boil the water. So if, I can, if I'm operating it at um, this plant at 600 C, then I'm gonna have 550 C steam coming out. That's just slightly like the coal plants, modern coal plants are like uh, 565 C yeah, and, and, in it. And, and so we're really close. But if I go to 1000 C, on this using this configuration so that would be this configuration this configuration now i can go to a thousand c it's not clear that i would even want to use a steam turbine first you would run a gas turbine and then run a steam turbine as a combined cycle i asked this question also because i i saw the figures on the electrical efficiency i mean basically the other mm -hmm. what you have a thermal and then what you get out and it's still like 33 percent right. well 33 percent is light water reactor efficiency our efficiency is 40% for the one that's operating at okay. 600C, and it's more like 50% if you're operating at 1000C. Uh, okay. uh, yes. No, then the figure was, not, was, was uh, rather the, the light water reactor and not... Right. I wanted to give you a comparison of okay. what, how, are, how are we doing compared to today's reactors. Okay. And, and, and that plays back into the fuel utilization rate. Right, so if I'm burning stuff at 50% efficiency versus 33% efficiency, I can't burn spent fuel as fast as a light water reactor. The light water reactor can't actually burn the fuel, so that's kind of a moot point. So, last question: um, What are you missing in terms of uh, human capital? Let's say, if you, if you capital. Yes, human capital. Human capital or capital capital? Human capital. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, if you have if you have fresh credits coming from nuclear engineering or process engineering and. and Related fields, and you, they want to go into the molten salt reactor domain. Uh, what would you say are things that are still missing? What should chemical engineering? Chemical engineering. Chemical engineering and multi physics engineering. All right. And uh, uh, lack of a water reactor bias, <laughs> or solid fuel bias, for that matter. The presence of solid fuel. Correct. Right, because this, this stuff is real different yeah, well, if you start I thinking about it. I am it. looking for a PC, but in Europe it's, uh, it's very hard. It's in, in Europe you have the anti-nuclear bias. So. <laughs> you have that in the United States too. The only place that doesn't have that really is, is China. Yeah. And technically, AP-1000 in China would have been started up last fall if it weren't for anti-nuclear in China. So they have it too. You're welcome. So, so I have a question about the material. Right? So you, you're, you know, you're, you're saying you're throwing all these materials together, and it becomes so-called spent fuel. It's well, it's, so it's, it's, it's oh, the category, right? yes. So I, I'm taking spent fuel and mixing it with the plutonium, which then makes it basically still spent fuel with a little bit higher plutonium. So then, in before it goes into the reactor, and even after. It's being used that in the reactor, and you just take that material. Like, how much effort would it be to separate all the different, you know, materials into something that could be used? For? Could be used for what? Light water reactor, solid fuel. Well, yeah, you would have to use our current process. You would, you could use our process to take out some of the fission products, but you would still need to. Um, use the existing process, either pyro processing or purex processing, to get the high separations. I mean, what we're specifically doing is unengineering the the, the weapons processes. Yeah. Use yeah. only the steps that are bad at doing separations because we don't need good separations. So, so in essence, you're increasing the effort to reverse reverse engineer, or if you want to call it that, to to actually it become something that is not intended for its original use. Correct, correct, correct. We're using a very small piece of it, um, of the technology, and it's actually different than what they're, what they're talking about using even for pyroprocessing to do it. And like I said, we've already reviewed this with the NNSA for our fuel production, and they said, oh yeah, you guys aren't doing reprocessing. I mean, we're not separating anything. The other process and stuff 
we do more separations, but we specifically make it so you can't do good separations. So you would have to do a lot more steps to do good separations. And if I heard you correctly, if you, let's say, shut down this reactor and you just let it sit for a year, this is actually a good safeguarding principle because that year in between is what is something that's important. Well, this reactor and stuff, it's good forever because it's always denatured, right? And there's no protactinium, protactinium in it. The one that I said leave sit for a year is if, you're, if you put thorium in the reactor, whether it's just in the core or if it's in a blanket, you need to, you need to lock it up for a, at least a year after um, shutdown to prevent access to the, shall we say, easy access to U-233 weapons. What about the idea of uh, um, the contaminating the thorium from the beginning with fission products? Like say, fission products by itself are not a protection. It's easy to remo remove, especially for the fluorides, all right? All you have to do is bubble fluorine gas through the liquid salt in the fluorine if you, if you have the uranium-233 in there and you strip out all the uranium. So that's actually pretty easy. Or if you do protactinium and stuff, it's <laughs> chemically fairly easy to strip out protactinium from that. So it's only, it's only if you have the denatured stuff from the beginning with uranium-238 in there that you really get the protection. And, and you still have to worry about the protactinium for a while. Some of the companies have actually said, uh, let's, um, Let's run on a pure thorium cycle, which is weapons grade uranium-233 in the reactor, but have a molten salt vat of uranium-238 above it. So if somebody attacks you, you can dump the uranium-238 into the salt really fast and denature it so, you, so somebody can't come and steal it. That's great, right? But it doesn't solve the internal actor, right? Or the, the state actor, right? It still gives you access, if, if you're a state or you're a, bad actor in the company, you still might have access to it if you're doing reprocessing, which is why I kind of like the no reprocessing version. Can I get your question? Certainly. Okay. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thanks. Thank you. Well, beyond this, great. Uh, beyond this brilliant physics and chemistry, uh, in practical terms, do you think it has the potential to be considered as the machine for this famous story with 30 tons of plutonium. So uh, burn up 30 tons of plutonium according to the agreement. Oh, absolutely. So it's yeah. it can I be considered as uh, the main uh, option? Or? It will. The, the reason why we weren't approaching Santa Savannah River is because the senator from South Carolina and stuff where they're located was very keyed in on retaining and obtaining funding for the MOX project because mm -hmm. that provided a lot of jobs in his state. All right? So we didn't really approach them for that. But the reason why I went to the INMM spent fuel conference in, in uh, DC was to kind of like present there is another option out there without actually saying I'm going to go to Savannah River. Mm -hmm. But I knew Savannah River would be there. Right. <coughs> so after I did my talk, I was surrounded by Savannah River and Oak Ridge people. And we got into a discussion. I said, so, so any chance that I would be able to get access to the plutonium? Because I described the, the process of, of you know, using weapons grade plutonium and stuff and denature it with spent fuel. And they go, yeah, yeah, probably. So, okay, all right, since you're spending a lot of money to retain that or we're spending a lot of money to get rid of it via other methods, would we be able to get paid to, to consume that? And they said, yes, probably. Now, Admittedly, neither that guy has the ability to speak for Savannah River, and Savannah River doesn't have the ability to speak for NNSA, right? So there's still a ways to go there, right? And then I said, okay, uh, so, so I, I did that. So he said, yes, we probably could get paid for getting rid of the plutonium. And I had already talked to him about, well, doing a prototype there, so we don't have to ship it. But anyhow, and then he goes, he quoted me a very big number for getting rid of the plutonium, which would have been enough to finance developing of, of the fuel conversion and the prototype at Savannah River. All right, and then he asked me, can you do it in two years? <laughs> because apparently there's something about they have two years worth of funding to 
do work on getting rid of the plutonium and they have to get start state law says they have to get rid of so much money in within two, or so much of the plutonium within two years to show that they're making progress to getting rid of it and my guess is that big number is probably a combination of how much it would take to do it and the state uh, penalties associated with not getting rid of it so the fact this machine how many kilograms per year can well, the initial startup is going to be about uh, 10 metric tons, right? With well, with a 10 megawatt thermal one and stuff, the life cycle? half of half of the fuel is in the core, half of it's outside the core. So there's going to be five tons in the core yeah. plus a tiny minute out. So maybe maybe six tons. Uh, initial startup, all right. But don't forget, we've already denatured that. So it's so I asked him. I said, is it, is the denatured enough? to count for the state penalty stuff if, we, if it's no longer weapons grade. And then you put it in the reactor, of course, it, it denatures it even more than that. But after the startup, the large, the one gigawatt reactor <coughs> um, will burn about one metric ton of year spent nuclear fuel, but not plutonium. I don't need fissile, all right? So if you want to get rid of the plutonium fissile, you got to build more reactors. Well, that's not true. I can burn plutonium in the reactor. It's just, why would I? I've got enough spent fuel to burn to do that. Actinides burning, so actually, oh, optimal, all right. So, so, <laughs> most optimal machine. So when I was when I was in the Navy, they, they always called me because I had the ability to look outside the water box, yeah. right? And I was looking at this when I was still at the Navy. You know, stuff on my own is how can I use it to solve commercial problems or political problems and that's what that's what got me the focus on it's not just safeguards design it's political problems by design solutions